Should I wait for the stragglers or? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, welcome to uh, Platform Pressures and Perils, a meandering chat about how computers shape the games they run. Um, who am I to talk about this stuff? Um, well, after I graduated with a degree in computer science, I went into uh, indie game development for about six months, and then we ran out of capital, as indie games can sometimes do, um, and sort of had to go get a, a day job in, in the real world. Um, later on, I made a game called uh, Smaze uh, for the TIG Source DMake competition, um, back when that was a thing, several years ago. God, that's old. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the only, I only bring it up because Anthony Carboni, when he was doing Bite Jacker, um, said it was his most look for, looked forward to game while the competition was going on. And that was sort of the high watermark for me in game development. And I kind of peaked there where Anthony Carboni said I didn't suck. And that was sort of the, the, my claim to fame in game development at this point. Um, so uh, ever since then, I've basically been doing uh, programming by day. And by night, uh, I've run a web show uh, called Aaron Signal on YouTube. Don't worry, I'm not one of those angry, rawr, YouTube people, um, I'm a little bit more uh, calm. Uh, the show basically focuses on doing close reads of games um, and, and trying to look at whether a game works thematically, trying to tear apart its mechanics and whether it succeeded or failed at what it was trying to do. Um, but I guess what I'm really trying to say is um, I am no longer at this point obviously a game developer um, and despite trying to keep abreast of as much of the reading as possible, um, I am not an academic. Uh, so what I'm really, really trying to say is um, take everything I'm saying here with a gigantic grain of salt. Um, <laughs> Uh, none of this is meant to be prescriptive or declarative or authoritative or anything other than just sort of thoughts to, to guide game developers and, and guide the students um, as, as they work on games going forward. I don't know what that came from. Um, so when Ulf contacted me to do this speech, he wanted me to sort of uh, take a look at um, a video, video I had done previously on a... Uh, um, game violence and, and, and how games tended to so often and so frequently come back to violent combat and um, conflict. Um, but I think when I went to go back and sort of expand on that, I feel like the original video missed the point maybe a little bit um, because, I mean, obviously games can be uh, quite violent, um, sometimes ridiculously hyper-violent. We have gotten quite good at, you know, dollops of gore and misty sprays of blood. Particle effects guys have made careers doing this stuff. Um, but I feel like uh, the reason violence comes so naturally to games um, is more restrictive and a little bit more harmful to games than the violence itself. Um, there are forces that push digital games towards certain directions, including violent conflict directions, um, and I think we need to take a look at those. Um, and what forces would those be? Uh, I would argue that it's the platforms themselves. Um, I don't mean, in this context, Xbox or PlayStation platforms. Um, I'm speaking kind of a level of abstraction up from that. Um, so to kind of unpack that, let's back up a bit and talk about uh, games. Um, at the risk of opening the Pandora's box of what is a game, that whole debate, um, I think it's somewhat safe to say that games are um, basically a, a bunch of rules that, that form a system. Um, now, that can be, uh, there can be a win state or a lose state like you know, football, or there could be no win state or lose state like The Sims. Um, maybe, it run, maybe whatever game we're talking about runs really rigid, hard, uh, concrete, formal, Turing-complete rules like Doom, or maybe they're more loose and ethereal like um, a kid playing with an action figure or a tea party uh, sort of a scenario. Um, pretend tea party, not an actual tea party. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so anyway, a game needs something at least akin to rules. Um, it needs something that is at least notionally rule-like. Um, even the play of like little animals, uh, puppies, when they're play fighting, um, have the implicit rule of you can't harm one another because if you start harming one another, it's no longer play fighting, you're just beating each other up. Um, even the play of uh, playing a, a, a pretend tea party uh, involves trying to adhere to a certain level of etiquette, even if it's etiquette as viewed from a child's perspective, um, because if you go in there just swearing and, and trying to guzzle down tea, I think you would be kicked out of a pretend tea party pretty quick. Um, so, yeah. Um, so platforms in this context would be um, how those rules are executed. Um, you have players that, uh, that generate input into a system, and that system then generates output that the players then interpret, and that's sort of the whole shebang. Um, this is important because the uh, inputs and outputs obviously can change the game pretty fundamentally. Uh, I think we've seen that a lot with a lot of the games out in the, uh, the hall. 
Um, changing the way you interact with the game can fundamentally change your experience with it. Um, but also, the thing that actually executes the um, system itself, the rule execution system, um, is critically important. Um, so let's take a look at uh, maybe um, some analog games and how that gets structured. Analog games, typically you end up with, uh, well, in terms of input and output, they're largely the same thing. You have the boards and you have the pieces, the die, the dominoes, uh, the tokens, the figurines. These are both how you make moves in board games and analog games and also how you um, uh, see the output of results. Um, with uh, more abstract childhood play, obviously, there's, there's fewer knickknacks and doodads. You end up being a little bit more, um, a little bit more headspace based and a little bit more imagination based. Um, but generally speaking, that's how you communicate input and output in an analog game. Um, but more interesting to me than the uh, inputs and outputs in analog games is the uh, system execution piece, which is, of course, a human brain, um, which is the platform that analog games basically run on. Um, we don't typically think of them this way. Uh, we, use, we like to think that um, games in like something like Monopoly exist in the rule book. Uh, that's where the games live, and then we all play the game, and then that is just how the games work. But really, that's not true. Um, the actual rule execution happens uh, internally in human minds, um, and there's some good things and bad things about using a human mind to process rules. Um, bad things, um, it's really slow to process rules. Um, human brains can't do that many rules per second. Um, also, the human brain doesn't really deal with a large number of variables very easily, which is why we tend to rely so heavily on tokens and player character sheets and various other things to mark down what's actually happening. Um, but it does also have this really peculiar attribute that pretty much everything that happens um, is, to some degree or another, kind of subjective, um, which leads to some interesting uh, gameplay developments. Um, especially because in most, most uh, board games and analog games, you're not talking about a single player playing the game, you're talking about multiple players playing the game. And that sort of means that um, the uh, rule execution system for uh, board games ends up being almost a biological uh, distributed computing network where each brain is processing the rules uh, individually and then they have to reconcile uh, the, the results of the systems, uh, the result of the state change of the system um, and communicate that to one another. Um, and you can do a lot with this in terms of game design, and it pushes board games in very specific directions. Um, let's look at maybe some examples. So Cops and Robbers. Um, we got Steve Criminal and Bobby Cops. Um, I would argue that Cops and Robbers is a system-based game, kind of. Um, there are teams, two separate teams, uh, and there are states uh, for every member on that team. Um, you can have alive, dead, or depending on the complexity of the version of Cops and Robbers playing, arrested, or some other state. Um, and the goal for, that, uh, for both players is to move the entire enemy team to the other state. Um, that's a pretty gamey, systems-driven thing, pretty systems-driven concept. Um, the rub is that there's no formally agreed upon way to do that. Um, uh, this is, there's no really any real meaningful way to establish how someone gets moved from alive to dead in Cops and Robbers. This is where you get the classic uh, childhood fight sequence of, bang, I got you. No, you didn't, because I was behind a, a crate that's bulletproof. Well, yeah, well, my department got more funding earlier this month, and I've got magic bulletproof or bulletproof crate penetrating bullets. Yeah, well, I don't think that that's true. Well, I think it did happen, and that's where you get some really interesting um, gameplay, because uh, that's sort of what the gameplay is. Um, Cops and Robbers is sort of a combination of pantomime and arguing um, Ca causality in a system that doesn't really exist. Um, uh, the act of playing Cops and Robbers is socially negotiating the system as you play it, um, which makes Cops and Robbers sort of a primitive, uh, ludic version of Rashomon, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's no real structure to the game, but it's a game about reconciling your narrative with those of others. Um, it's a game about building empathy, understanding the perspectives of others, while still defending your perspective and your experiences. Um, even if on the surface it's just a bunch of kids going, bang, bang, bow, pow, I got you. So that's kind of cool. Um, and it's not just kids' games that have this sort of uh, interesting social element that emerges from having uh, the, the game state exist in player, player minds. Um, poker, the raw formal system, is a game about mathematical chance and not much else. Uh, you draw some cards, you assess whether you want to hold them or fold them, as the song goes, and uh, that's largely it. That's how you play poker. Um, but I think part of the reason for poker's enduring uh, popularity is that it's a very social game by its nature. Um, it's a game about reading people's faces and looking for tells, um, trying to understand when an opponent is bluffing. Um, and bluffing is an interesting concept because it's not something that's necessarily explicitly stated in the rules, because if you remove all of the human aspects from the game um, and basically have AIs play it, um, it's basically just a bad play. 
Um, the whole point of bluffing is that you can convince other people you have a good hand uh, through body language and through uh, your facial expression and remaining as stoic as possible. Um, it's not necessarily a, a good idea um, because they can call your bluff. Um, this is such a fundamental aspect of poker, actually, that we try to emulate it when we bring it into digital systems. Um, we try to generate uh, players that have certain AI profiles uh, and, and try to emulate that sort of social aspect of getting to know a player. So you end up having um, AI uh, opponents that maybe have um, a more aggressive play style or tend to bluff at, at really weird times and have erratic behavior or play really defensively or like to make really big bets regardless of their hand. Um, and part of the game is getting to know that the personalities of those you're playing against. Um, uh, you can describe the state of a game of poker just by laying out who has what cards and their percentage odds of winning, but if you do that, you really ignore the human element that so strongly defines the game and I think has contributed to its enduring popularity. Um, or alternately, there's role-playing games. Look at Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it has hard, formal rules for combat, abilities, movement, speech, craft. There's books for just about anything in that universe. Um, in a formal system sense, Dungeons and Dragons is very much a game about players looking at their stats uh, and being at the mercy of the almighty die. But in practice, that's not really what happens. Um, the game intentionally obfuscates those rules from the player uh, the, by putting all of the uh, main rule execution in the hands of the DM behind a screen who has special access to knowledge the rest of the players don't have. Um, this re results in DMs who can lie about uh, what the rules. Uh, this results in DMs who can lie about what the rules say should have happened um, to achieve a smoother gameplay experience, or better tell a story in a climactic or engaging way, or maybe to help players who are new to the game get acclimated if you know, on turn two of their first combat encounter, they would have died to a critical hit. Uh, maybe you don't want to end the game quite that soon. Um, and I know there are DMs that would prefer to do that, but D&D gives you the option to go either way. Um, it's a game where the formal systems do matter, but a game that could be overwritten at any time by the DM to achieve goals beyond adhering to the system. Um, it allows for players to invent their own solutions to problems that aren't just explicit rules that exist. Uh, you can basically come up with a, any sort of um, alternative approach to solving a problem that you can think of, and the DM makes a call about what kind of uh, dice roll you would need to achieve that. So what I'm getting at is uh, analog brain-based games tend to be squishy, um, and I apologize, I have a terrible penchant for sloganeering, uh, as you may know. Um, <laughs> Uh, squishy games is just sort of my name for soft and formal rule systems that, that are maybe sort of not rigidly defined and are really more up for interpretation than are actually formal systems. Um, they tend to be ambiguous, subjective, with unclear boundaries and porous magic circles. Um, and again, they usually almost always show up in analog or non-digital games. Um, they, they're important because it allows us to explore concepts like subjectivity, like in uh, Cops and Robbers, uh, incorporate real and complex behavior into play, um, can have porous magic, I've said that already, ignore that, um, and they, can, they allow us to tell better stories and focus on social and frankly more human elements in, in gameplay. Um, it's why we have family game night uh, around a bunch of Hasbro games and not family game night around a bunch of Counter-Strike servers. Um, so that's cute, I guess, brains can shape board games, but isn't this talk about computers, Chris, get back on topic? Um, yes, it, it is also about that. Um, the platform of computers has fundamentally shaped the, uh, the way the games are executed there, too. Um, computer, games found a home on computers fairly early on. Um, I mean, you had uh, Tennis for Two in 1958 on oscilloscopes, then Space War a few years after that, and then Pong a few years after that. And as soon as uh, consumer-grade uh, electronics were affordable and available, uh, basically you had the uh, modern computer gaming scene emerge. Uh, video games have been with computers since pretty much forever. Um, and the reason is that computers are really good at running systems, uh, obviously. They remember things way better than any human being could, um, which allow them to have way more variables than those sort of limited token and figurine-based games we were looking at a minute before. Um, they can also execute rules for us really quickly. Um, it's kind of hard to appreciate uh, that because it's sort of obvious on one hand and also sort of we've had computers for three, three decades now. It's four decades now, uh, that are sort of home computers that can blow uh, any sort of manual game system away. but I mean, if you really step back and look at it, a turn in D&D is supposed to last something like six seconds, and depending on uh, the controversial nature of whatever decisions the players make and just how long it takes to roll the die to do you hit, how much damage, uh, a six-second turn in D&D can take something like, you know, five, ten, even 15 minutes. Um, it, computers can do that kind of thing in real time. 
obviously everybody's played stuff like you know Diablo or The Witcher or whatever, and again, it seems trivial, but that's something that fundamentally couldn't exist before computers just because rule execution platforms didn't exist to do that. Um, finally, they can display the state of the system, which makes it really convenient. Um, you don't need to print out custom uh, figurines or keep track of die. It's a system that executes rules and comes with its own input devices and output devices, so it basically is three quarters of everything you would need to have a system that operates uh, games. Um, Video games were a fundamentally new platform, um, and when they arrived, pretty much uh, all developers started, uh, all developers changed their philosophy about what it meant to um, develop games for computers in terms of asking what the system could do for them. Um, these, this is new technology, it's sexy technology. Uh, even in the 80s and 70s, it was this amazing new thing that could calculate all these different rules and remember hundreds if not thousands and now hundreds of millions of variables. Um, how can we make games that take advantage of this? How can we explore this brave new world of what computers can do? Um, and this uh, came with some benefits and it came with some trade-offs. Um, it made games more complex and allowed for, again, real-time game systems that could never exist in the real world without computers. Uh, but it also had some bad side effects, like it killed squishiness. Um, analog games uh, are the, really the ones that uh, focus on sort of that soft, ambiguity, squishy stuff. Um, and we know that an, uh, um, squishy games can exist. We saw them earlier. Um, but they really never made the jump over to the digital realm uh, because we were so focused on making sure that computers could execute these things. A lot of this has to do with the fact that, again, um, computers are these sort of rigid formal rule execution systems that require, um, uh, that require Turing complete formal systems to operate, and so you lose all that squish. You lose all that ambiguity. Um, but not only did computers sort of limit what systems we could build by kind of getting rid of all that fun squished stuff, um, it also started pushing us in very specific directions of what games were easy to build. Um, and I'm going to make a ridiculously pretentious oversimplification starting now, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm basically going to compress all of video games and entire artistic medium down to uh, sort of two rules, and that's ridiculously reductive and unfair, but we'll unpack that in a little bit, so just bear with me. Um, so basically, uh, the approach for giving the entirety of game systems over to the computer resulted in what I would argue are sort of two overall approaches to computer game design. Um, at a high enough level, you can think of them as sort of the two kind of real rules that have ever really been on a computer. Uh, I call them back end spreadsheets and spatial simulations because, again, I'm terrible at sloganeering and also bad at coming up with names. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, this is, again, really, really reductionist, and I want to recognize that, um, and I want to be careful, careful about keeping that in mind. But also, I feel like there's some truth to, to what's up there. Um, uh, I think it's just the, the symptoms of the limitations of a machine that only speaks in formal systems. Uh, the rule execution can only happen in these sort of two different ways, and we'll get into them in a second. Um, just like analog games easily invoke ideas of, of humans communicating because of the way they get run, uh, computers just tend towards these two approaches because that's how computers think. Um, and for the record, uh, games do tend to use both. I don't mean to make this an either-or thing. It's not a left-right thing. It's not some games be like this and other games be like that. Um, pretty much all games have some spatial components and some sort of back-end system rules. Uh, Civilization obviously has the space of the game board uh, and moving things around in a spatial sense, but also has rules uh, that are more back-end calculate based like uh, damage done between units or how uh, your science score is calculated. Whereas Doom, a game very much about moving around in a 3D space and dodging bullets, um, still has back-end rules that you can't quite see about things like um, did the monster I just kill drop health, how much damage did I do, what's the shotgun spread, that sort of thing. So, both, so games tend to use um, both approaches, and it's just a matter of degrees, although games do tend to move heavily in one direction or the other, even though every game does use a little, little bit of both. Um, so let's look at back end spreadsheet rules. Um, abstractly, uh, these are rules that change the state of the game in non-spatial ways. I tend to think of them basically just as board game rules on steroids. Um, they're typically not visualized to the player, um, but their outputs are. So you get things like damage done versus uh, the damage algorithm. Borderlands doesn't tell you how it calculates damage based on your gun's weapon stats and how far away you are and uh, other shield buffs and all the other stuff. You don't know the algorithm for that, uh, but what you do see is a big 300 when it pops up when you actually you know, shoot one of the monsters. Um, there are exceptions that do tell you how these things are calculated. So again, civilizations, various calculations are pretty transparent to the player. Um, but generally speaking, uh, these sort of back-end rules are, are hidden from the player um, and can be as simple as damage calculations or as complicated as Dwarf Fortress simulating an entire world's history for centuries uh, before you've even started playing. Um, and there are some tremendous benefits to, to approaching games like this, uh, of looking at games as basically how can we take board games and make them infinitely more co cal uh, complicated. Uh, 
Uh, for one, you can cover a huge variety of topics as long as they can be formally systemized. Um, you know, if you've ever wanted to run a YouTube channel and, and edit videos together and try to pretend uh, that, that, you know, uh, you, you want to sell yourself out for, for views. Um, or, uh, <laughs> or you can, you know, hack uh, across international lines for your anonymous bidders or colonize the, the uh, Americas or follow the dynasty of a series of heirs across multiple generations and their intrigue and, and uh, uh, national interests. Um, or you can uh, look at, again, Dwarf Fortress and, and sort of the, uh, uh, follow a, a family of dwarves as, as they try to survive uh, in this world that has all this history where you'll be lucky to live for maybe five days. Um, all of these are possible because basically we took board game mechanic style rules and amped them up to a million um, with way more variables than could ever reasonably be done with a human brain. Um, and yeah, because some of these can actually be played manually, but you would not want to. Um, especially games like Civilization ostensibly could be played by hand if you had a, a, an abacus and a lot of free time. But, but you wouldn't like that. Um, it really is sort of a, a result of moving to computers and the benefits of the platform pushing us in these particular directions. Um, but there are downsides uh, to being able to have all this power and be being able to explore all these uh, games and themes. Um, one is that with these sort of back endy game rules, communication with players is really difficult. Um, you have a million variables and it can be hard to convey uh, what is happening or why stuff is happening. Um, uh, this is a screenshot from Democracy 3, which I love, because um, it shows you all these different icons that imply the game is dealing with really interesting issues from religion to health to economics to war. Um, and it means very little if you have not, if you don't understand what every icon means and what the, what the actual menu is. Um, uh, you also end up with problems uh, internalizing too many systems. Uh, perceivable consequence kind of goes out the window. Uh, players struggle to understand how to push these uh, systems in specific directions or towards specific ends. So if you're playing Democracy 3 and you look at, you know, uh, motorists are yellow, what of these icons do we need to change to make motorists not yellow? How do I get motorists on my side? I, maybe the, I don't, I, hangman. Um, <laughs> it becomes very difficult. Um, uh, oh, oh, also, and uh, you also have problems with abstractions in, in communicating uh, back information back to the players. You run into the classic civilization problem of why did that tank lose to an archer? Um, and it's totally what the system would expect to happen because you're executing the rules that you expected and the player ends up questioning, is the problem with the representation or is the problem with the back end rules? And there, there's a disconnect there. Um, and you have to be careful to avoid that. Um, and not only is output uh, of information about the state of the system uh, to the player difficult, but getting um, input is very difficult to these sort of more back endy systems. Uh, you end up with menus the video game fairly often. Um, and it's not necessarily any, any designer's fault per se. Um, menus, sliders, and spreadsheet interfaces are just how we have, uh, are the tools we have to deal with really complicated uh, systems, whether that's an operating system, which allows you to configure it based on all sorts of menus and settings, or Roller Coaster Tycoon, which allows you to configure its entire uh, environment using primarily menus and settings and sliders and, and tick boxes. Um, there's really no avoiding it. Um, they're the best we have, but they, uh, the, they're the best we have, and they're not terrible, uh, but they do require a fair bit of learning, which sort of makes point of entry to these games a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, you know, try to get anyone who's never played a game before to sit down and play something like uh, Europa Universalis, and it, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and, and they make the, uh, the act of physically interacting with these games a bit sedate, uh, because you're basically doing nothing but clicking on menus and moving through uh, sliders and that sort of thing. It becomes very difficult to, you know, roller coaster tycoon, I love it, but it, playing it doesn't feel like a thrill ride. Um, playing it feels a little sedate, and it feels really rewarding and creative, um, but that feeds into, um, uh, this, less narrative driven. Um, Systemsy games tend to care about systems above all else. Um, spatial games tend to have, uh, whereas spatial games tend to have a focal character. Uh, this makes it easier to convey a traditional scripted narrative. Um, I love my Sims family and I love my uh, Crusader Kings lineage, but no one in this audience has heard about their grand exploits, adventures, or, or uh, funny stories as much as I love them. But I can stand up here and talk to you about Mario or Gordon Freeman all day and everyone here will know basically what I'm talking about. Um, and that's, that's a big detriment when you're trying to sort of push uh, these games to, uh, to players and sell them on something. It, it's hard to put The Sims on a t-shirt. It's easy to put a Lambda or Gordon Freeman on a t-shirt. 
Um, all of this makes for uh, all of this makes back uh games uh, di more difficult to sell. Um, again, they're slower, uh, more cerebral. They have a higher learning learning curve. Um, they're less sexy for advertisers because again, there's no exciting conflict. It's mostly isometric uh, screens of uh, maps. Um, there's no known characters. It's often difficult to port because they require usually PC input. Um, and I want to, this sounds like I'm ragging on them, but I don't at all. I, I love these games. These are some of my favorite games. If anything, we need more systems driven games looking critically at, at other games that, uh, or other uh, things and systems. Um, excuse me, I need water. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if anything, we need more systems-based stuff. Um, but all of this stuff does mean that, um, that, that the industry as a whole and the medium does tend towards, uh, to fa towards favoring the other uh, easy CPU approach, sexy spatial simulations. Um, now, you might think that spatial simulations are basically um, effectively another form of number crunching. And, and at a high enough level of abstraction, you're not wrong. But I would argue that there are several things that, that make it a little bit more unique. Um, First, computers have been doing spatial calculations basically since they were invented. The ENIAC, the first general purpose computer, was built in the 40s largely to calculate artillery trajectories faster than any human could for World War II. Um, so computers have literally been built to uh, tell you the trajectories of where bullets go, if you needed any reason or any uh, insight as to how this started as a video on game violence. Um, and the entire field of physics is dedicated to uh, breaking down uh, the world into formula that can be easily plugged into a computer and generate a, a basic Newtonian physics uh, simulation. Um, essentially, Newtonian physics equations are a how-to guide for building simulations of physical worlds. Um, and they work really, really well with computers. Um, and the output is also really, really spatial. Uh, they're visual, uh, the monitors tend to be visual, and visual tends to be spatial. Um, and it's interesting that, to me at least, that it's you know, way easier as, a, as somebody who's making a game to uh, set up a game of Pong or Tetris than Settlers of Catan or chess on a computer. Um, even though Pong and Tetris have to, um, have to execute more rules per second, uh, the rules per second they execute are much simpler and they get up on screen much faster. Um, uh, and ultimately, that's because spatial simulation um, basically just requires a lot of fast, simple com uh, calculations that are the same across all uh, all spatial games. Um, you can't say that for you know, if I come up with a roller coaster tycoon game, I can't easily use uh, my ride fun algorithm in a game about building subways. It just doesn't migrate uh, the way that spatial simulation does. Um, and the fact that all uh, spatial simulation equations are basically the same means we have plenty of AI APIs to make that even easier. We have OpenGL, DirectX, PhysX, Havoc, um, any number of uh, APIs designed from the ground up to uh, basically make simulating a pretend space that much easier and that much uh, quicker to get up and running. Um, we don't have APIs for simulating uh, Dwarf Fortress histories and making that go faster. We don't have um, you know, graphics, the graphic card equivalent of something that can simulate an entire economy for a Euro uh, Europa Universalis, uh, but we do have graphics cards to make sure things look really pretty and render in a 3D space uh, as accurately and as beautifully as possible. Um, in addition to that, um, spatial systems are super easy to communicate to players. Uh, where uh, displaying the state of the systems in a more abstract, systems-heavy game can be hard, uh, displaying the state of spatial simulations is very, very easy. Uh, the uh, Diplom or Democracy 3 screenshot uh, was very, very difficult to read, but these are very easy to read. Um, who's winning that race? The yellow car. I don't even have to say it. It's just self-evident. Um, is the room in the, uh, that the Doom guy just entered safe? No, there's a lot of barons of hell. It's not safe. Get out of there. Um, it's very, very easy to communicate. Um, Spatial, spatial mechanics um, sell the state of the system just at a glance. Um, and you don't have to s explain how you calculated the crime rate of a block in SimCity or why two royals failed to court adequately to produce an heir. Uh, you just need to show them the space and they get what is happening in the space. Um, this makes spatial games uniquely intuitive and easy to grasp. They have a pick up and play uh, aspect that a lot of the more back end games lack. Um, also, spatial inputs are much easier to map. Um, we have basically uh, designed controllers just to do this. Um, we have uh, um, joysticks, directional pads, motion tracking controllers that mimic your physical movement in VR. Um, it's just very easy to translate directional input into spatial input, obviously. Um, not always super easy. You do have to make sort of the leap of taking two two-dimensional planes and mapping them to three-dimensional space, which can be a little bit difficult. Um, I know that I have family members that you know can't play an FPS game because 
uh, they don't know how to sort of wrap their head around one controls the camera and the other controls lateral physical movement. Um, but compared to, say, uh, taking input to uh, a, a natural language processor to save a marriage and facade, or stepping them through how to use a mouse to access a menu to alter uh, budgetary concerns in SimCity, um, I think it is su sufficiently more uh, easy uh, to, to communicate to players and to take their input. Um, really, this thing is designed for spatial input above all else. The modern um, dual analog controller really is just custom designed for spatial stuff. Um, in addition to the two analog sticks and a D-pad, we have three things on the surface of this thing designed just for spatial manipulation. Um, the triggers on the back, uh, their analog nature tends to support acceleration and braking for racing games, and their trigger shape tends to afford them a being a trigger for shooter games. And so it's unsurprising that's what you know, the Xbox is kind of known for, is shooting games and racing games. Um, the input, uh, input design is hugely important for shaping what sort of games get made on a given platform, and I think you can really see that there. Um, compare this to, say, touchscreens, which arguably have the same computational power, or at least enough to uh, generate spatial simulations, but because of the input, they really don't do that very much. You might end up with an infinite runner uh, that allows you to jump vertically and occasionally turn, or you end up with a, a racing game that allows you to um, uh, move horizontally. But in both cases, movement is largely one-dimensional, either vertically, up and down, or left and right. Um, I would assume, I don't have any studies to cite this, but I would assume it's due to the swipey nature of uh, inputs. It's very hard to simulate two-dimensional input uh, with uh, touch screen, but swiping is, is pretty easy, as is angling. Uh, with uh, motion controls. Uh, but really, a lot of um, mobile games end up splitting the difference and being kind of spatial and kind of back-endy uh, based on the nature of their input. You end up with games that are either match three games or you end up with uh, base builder mechanics that sort of employ a degree of things moving around on the screen, um, but also emphasize a lot of back-end stuff that requires minimal interaction from the player. Um, and we have become so obsessed with uh, spatial interaction, actually, that we have developed uh, an aesthetic for it. Um, we have developed game feel. Um, and think about how kind of weird that is, that the term we've sort of settled on for simulating motion, the sense of simulated motion, is game feel. Um, I mean, uh, Steve Swink in the book, uh, sort of in his book Game Feel, um, actually points out that um, you, know, you, could, you could attribute game feel to something like a car. Um, it's just a satisfying interaction that, that sort of as, as you move and as you have a sense of movement, um, it, it's, a, it's a satisfying response. Um, but we've decided that the thing that really should be, be the descriptor of that sense is game feel, which to me is, is just odd, um, because not all games have game feel. So it's, it's I think, an overly broad term. Um, but it's a sense that can invoke pleasure in a satisfying hit or tightly controlling vehicle, or it's a sense that can invoke pain by, being having, by having sloppy, loose controls um, that, that basically could be a punishment for either you know, drinking uh, booze in an FPS game and having you pretend you're drunk, or uh, hitting an oil patch in a racing game, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, they are basically bad game feel could be used as, as a punishment. Uh, but the point is we spend a lot of time and energy in games not only perfecting spatial simulation, uh, but turning itself into something of, of an art with an aesthetic um, and all of this leads to the immense popularity of spatial games. Um, we have uh, all of that stuff that I just said, basically. Uh, accessibility in short order, readability at a glance, uh, portability to different platforms, sellable conflicts involving shooting, running, uh, driving, hiding, um, more often narrative focused than system driven games because you have a singular character, uh, usually in spatial games that you don't necessarily have in more systems driven games. Um, and so as a result of all of that stuff, uh, games that focus on spatial simulation tend to dominate sales charts. Um, here's the 2016 uh, best selling games NPD. I believe these are worldwide for uh, Xbox, uh, PlayStation, and PC. Um, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, but I kind of came up with a legend uh, to sort of explain uh, what they are. And you see a lot of shooters and sports games, and that's kind of gonna be a recurring theme. Uh, here's 2015. Uh, the interesting thing with 2015 is the, uh, it has, I think, the one exception, the least spatially uh, motivated game in the top seller list, Minecraft Story Mode, immediately followed by Minecraft, the, the actual game. Um, but again, a lot of shooters, a lot, uh, lot of sports games. And 2014, same thing. A lot of shooters, a lot of sports games, and then Smash Brothers, uh, which is physical, just not shooty. Um, so this is sort of the oversimplified conundrum that I've been, I've been trying to get to um, uh, via making these ridiculous straw man arguments. Um, we want games to be about meaningful things, um, but we sacrificed games being about the people next to us when we went digital and lost a lot of that squish. Um, 
and market forces and technology make complex games about systems, structures, and things hard to sell and arguably harder to design because they don't have all those fancy APIs and technology. Uh, so the structure of video games as a business and as a technology pushes us towards spatial games with an emphasis on physical conflict. Uh, they tend to be, po and, and if you're gonna make something meaningful out of these games, they tend to either be uh, postmodern uh, deconstructions of the violence that they felt compelled to build in the first place, um, or cutscene-driven mature stories that largely ignore hours of unrelated violent gameplay. Uh, the Last of Us, the story, is largely about regret and loss and kind of being a selfish jerk in the post-apocalypse. Uh, the gameplay is about sneaking up behind zombies and slitting their throats. It's, it's totally disconnected from one another. Um, so this is the end of my gross oversimplification and we can now begin the teardown of the straw men. Uh, I apologize for boiling all of the entire artistic medium of games down to two things. Um, so what can we do to sort of push back up against what the, what the nature of the computer is trying to push us uh, towards? Uh, it turns out we can do a lot, actually. Um, game developers have been trying to find tricks and ways to push back against computer, how the computer operates for forever. And I figured I'd just go over a couple of quick examples. Um, as long as we're stuck making games that are uh, spatial, make the space matter. Um, Gone Home is a great example of this, um, along with other walking simulators. Uh, Gone Home in particular took uh, a lot of the um, environmental design from uh, Minerva's Den, Bioshock 2. Uh, a lot of that team basically quit and started to make this game. Um, and took a lot of the environmental lessons, uh, environmental design lessons that they had learned on that game with them, um, but removed all the combat. And as a result, it's basically a game about exploring the system, uh, or exploring the space, excuse me. And um, uh, a lot of that environmental design philosophy is seen here. Um, it's a game about spatial simulation, but it's less about the simulation part and more about the space itself and using the space to tell a, tell a story. Um, alternately, uh, make the movement through the space matter. Um, as long as we're stuck making spatial games, make a game where moving through it matters. Uh, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, uses its movement uh, mechanics to basically sell you on the relationship of two boys, uh, the act of, uh, of two brothers, specifically. Um, the act of moving, of overcoming obstacles physically, uh, becomes the way the relationship is conveyed to the player. Um, the player controls both of them at once, uh, one through each analog stick, and they need each other to um, make progress through the game environment. Uh, and because each brother has slightly different abilities, you get a sense of their personality and their codependence, and the game uses that uh, really, really well um, up to a really, really moving climax. Um, or you could embrace games' ability to look at things in systems. Um, like I said earlier, I really do not hate system-based games, even though I kind of spent five minutes in the speech uh, railing against them. Um, their games are really, really good at looking at systems uh, and things and abstract concepts. They are really good at that, and we don't do it enough. Uh, they're good at looking at war, trade, empire, family drama, cultural conflict, economics, religion, social systems, and all of these things are really easy, easy to explore when we look at them as systems and not as things we have to cram into a spatial game. Um, it's hard to cover religion in a first-person shooter. It's easy to cover, or easier to cover religion in sort of a, a system-based game. Um, and we've only scratched the surface of how to do this stuff. Um, I would argue, I think, that we have a little bit too much of a board game mentality uh, still sitting around in, in, um, in some of the uh, more system-based design uh, design legacies, uh, aesthetics, I don't know what you would say. Um, but basically, um, we need to start looking at things like uh, procedural rhetoric. Uh, Mall Industria, I think, like his McDonald's game is a good example of, of what can be done to not only have a, a game that is sort of back-end systems-driven, but also has a point and looks critically at a very real issue. Um, also, I think there's lots of research to be done in this area for, for GUIs and how to, how to make these games more accessible. Um, I know a lot of people that, that watch the History Channel, or, well, used to back when it showed history. Um, and uh, um, they, they love history, they love World War II, but it's, it's hard to get them to sit down with something like um, a Total War, just because the interface is so overwhelming. So I think there's plenty of work to be done to try to find ways to get these games, without losing sufficient uh, depth or nuance, uh, more accessible to more players. Um, finally, well not finally, but you can take back the squish, um, which is something that I think would be fantastic. Um, and basically all this means is putting the, the system back on the human minds to embrace that ambiguity that we sort of lost when we moved digital. Um, and a lot of games are already doing this. Um, for example, uh, the Jackbox Party Pack is really good at this. Um, um, obviously something like, like You Don't Know Jack itself is sort of a more formal quiz-based show, but something like TKO or Quiplash break down what it means to win and hands that back to the players. Um, so what does it mean to win uh, in these games? Uh, is it the funniest responses, the most clever responses, the ones that look the most like a real shirt? Um, the game makes no effort to systemize this and it's entirely left up to the players. Uh, as a result, you're negotiating what it means to win and hey, that's kind of like cops and robbers. 
Um, or there's DEF CON. Um, you can play it as a straight up R uh, RTS and be done with it in 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, and that's kind of boring. It's not a great game when played like that. Um, but it does have um, an office mode that is kind of interesting. Uh, basically, you can slow the game down to what it considers real time. And the game can be played over something like eight or nine hours. And uh, it also has an office mode that allows it to immediately shrink into a taskbar window, a taskbar tray icon, and notify you only when major changes have happened, like nuclear launches. And the design of this is to basically push players to play the game while at school or at work. You'd start the game up in the morning, everyone would sign in, uh, uh, deploy your units, and then as the day goes on, uh, make tr uh, alliances, uh, make threats, um, maybe launch some nukes, and then over lunch, talk to your coworker and tell him that you launched nukes at his country, and if he's, uh, if he's inclined to launch nukes at your other coworker, maybe you'll disarm them mid-flight, and then he has to decide whether he wants to believe you and that you will disarm them, uh, or he can totally reject that idea and uh, launch back at you. Um, and basically what you see is that it's uh, a design uh, that encourages bringing back that sort of uh, poker style bluff calling, uh, which I think is really fascinating. Um, or you could just say system schmishtums, who needs, who needs uh, systems? Um, content can still be king. Um, for example, hypertexts are, are a great example of this. Um, there's, you get all the benefits of nonlinearity and player input and choice, uh, but the, they're all in service to the actual uh, text itself. Um, the game system becomes a content delivery service rather than a focal point, and it allows you to tell some really interesting and, and beautiful and haunting stories. Um, or you could take a more traditional adventure game route. Instead of trying to minimize all uh, systems outright, um, you could try to have some systems. Uh, a lot of these games have a little bit of spatial simulation and a little bit of back-end rules simulation going on, a little bit of game feel happening, uh, but it's all in, sis uh, all in service to audiovisual content. Um, uh, they are, in some sense, Hypertext's bigger, more expensive brother. Um, player choice and game feel are all there if you need them, but really, again, it's just pushing uh, a content delivery service. Um, and there's probably far more that I haven't even been able to name or think of. Um, there are a million ways to push back against this, and people are doing this literally every day. Um, so I'm sure you'll find new and exciting ways to do the same as you move forward with your games. Um, in conclusion, I just want you to know that platforms have a warping effect on what you make, but they don't dictate what you make. Um, you can figure out how to bend the computer to your will. It's very easy to make a shooter or hyper-complex board game on a PC. It's harder to find something that will actually resonate with people. Um, and whatever you find can be systems-driven, content-driven, about people, about things, about love, about the economy. It can be about whatever. But find what you want to say through games and say it. Don't let the platform push you towards easy answers or lazy designs. Thank you. Questions? No? I think we're, oh, okay. So I really liked your oversimplification. It resonated <laughs> really well to me. I'm just interested, I'm, I'm an old gamer. You had an Apple IIe up there. I started on that mm -hmm. um, more years than uh, I want to think back to it. And I'm a big Total War player now. Something I've thought about was you know, how you change as you get older, because if you look at, you know, esports professionals now, they're, they're finished at about, you know, late 20s. And, and I've sort of noticed my, uh, me moving much more into a system type game as basically the, my reaction time is actually beginning to sort of, uh, if, if I sit down and play with the average 20 year old on, on any of those spatial games with reaction times, they're, they're gonna wipe mm -hmm. the floor with me. Have, have you noticed this? Uh, is, it, is it something that, that you're aware of as people sort of change age? Do they move from, from one type of game to another? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I haven't done any dem demographic studies, obviously. Um, but I, I do think that, that obviously it's, it's more difficult to... Uh, I, I think spatial games have a youth bias, and I think that uh, spatial games are popular in part because uh, most developers are comparatively young and often selling to an even younger audience. Um, I, I would love to see uh, games start moving, um, not moving away from spatial stuff, I love spatial stuff, but, but being more inclusive. And I think part of that necessitates having an older team of developers, um, having more people that are sort of less interested in, in the hyper-competitive, uh, god-tier fighting game style uh, uh, design and stepping back and saying, you know, how, how can we make a game that might appeal to a wider audience, especially an audience that isn't quite so competitive or quite so spatially uh, motivated. Hi, I have a question about the examples that you use for the topic variety. Can you go back to the slide real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Way too many 
these lads. So what we see here is a lot of domination and colonialist games. I'm wondering why you chose this as an example for topic variety. Um, that's a really good criticism, and honestly, these were the games that popped into my head when I was going down to my Steam list looking for games that, uh, that, that um, sort of exemplified these systems. Um, it's a valid criticism. Part of it, I would argue, is just the, the, uh, the nature of a lot of these system-driven board games are um, inherently sort of colonialist. Um, board games themselves, I mean, some of the most popular board games are inherently colonial. San Juan, or uh, uh, Risk, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's, it's an easy go-to for, for these sorts of systems. Um, in the same way that shooting, I think, is an easy go-to for spatial stuff, I think maybe colonialist empire building is a very easy go-to because it has that power fantasy and it has that, that, um, that, that easy uh, appeal of, 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 yes, it's a slower system that's more back-end driven, um, but it's still a game that is fundamentally a power fantasy and it plays to that. Um, but you're absolutely right, there are, there are plenty of games that are back-end systems driven that are not, you know, I have at least three world-conquering games up there and, and yeah, that probably could have been more diverse. I guess the thing that I was trying to argue is that it's a very specific power fantasy, perhaps, and when you talk about topic variety, you might specify what kind of power fantasies you're talking about. That's, that's a valid, yes, I agree. <laughs> um. Um, hi, thank you for a very interesting talk, and especially I, I love the way you ended it as this uh, appeal for doing something else than the easy thing. Um, I think my question even fits fairly well to the comment before, which is um, what do you think about, or do you want to also make connections to the actual yeah, material and, and historical past of games as something that has very clearly and organically grown out of military technology more than just guiding missiles. So there is research looking at the so-called military entertainment complex as a play on the military industrial complex um, that follows, for example, the development of all these strategy games out of training tools for the US Army from the Cold War, which is not why this is a easy go-to only, but the actual cultural origin of this. I mean, this is where this comes from. The people who started making games, first they made military tools for pre uh, preparing for whichever scenario in the Cold War. The technology is the same and it's converging again. The drones that literally shoot people are guided and, and controlled with PlayStation controllers. So these, these links, they are, they are obvious if you care to look for them. And um, so, yeah, I, I would think that this, this is something that you would like to stress there further beyond just this is what the tool pushes you to do because it's built that way, but that's actually what that tool is. Yes. No, I, I would agree um, I, entirely. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I absolutely, absolutely, I, I agree. Um, uh, it's sort of what I was trying to hint at with, with a lot of the, the lineage uh, conversation. Um, you know, you can trace the lineage of, of these sorts of games back to wargaming, and that uh, back to wargaming itself has its roots in you know planning attacks in, in World War II and shuffling uh, tanks around with the little, I don't know what you would call them, prods. Um, but yeah, um, and, and obviously there's a close relationship between. Um, uh, violent games, spatial games, and, and a lot of what the military is doing now. And yeah. I think that is, th that is troubling. Which, which makes this not a colonial power fantasy, it makes it colonial power. Yes, uh, arguably colonial uh, propaganda. I mean, it, it really is, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Okay, well, thank you.